You have just listened to a group of boys and girls perform as an orchestra. An orchestra is made up of several different instruments which have been grouped together as families according to similar characteristics. These boys and girls started on their instruments last year as beginners. So this is the second year on these instruments. Just as they had an opportunity a year ago to choose which instrument they wish to play, you will soon have that same opportunity. Today we're going to demonstrate these instruments for you and explain how the sound is produced. After this is done, we will put all the instruments together and show you how we build an orchestra. The first group of instruments which we will inspect today will be the woodwind family. And we'll ask Mr. Hills to explain these for us. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Hello, boys and girls. We're going to talk about three instruments from the woodwind family that you as fifth graders will have an opportunity to start on if you so desire. The first member of the woodwind family we'll talk about today is the flute. Now before we do this, I want you to watch me try to make a sound on a pop bottle. Mm. Mm. Now the reason I did that is because there's a great similarity between producing a tone on a flute and making a sound on a pop bottle. The underlying principle is, of course, that we blew air across an open tone hole, sort of like. Now, Gail is a member of our sixth grade orchestra, has her flute ready. Gail, would you show us that opening or tone hole on the flute? Now, if we're going to produce a tone on the flute, we must place the flute against our lips in such a fashion that we can blow air across that opening, and then we will produce a sound. Gail will now demonstrate blowing the flute by playing a portion of a tune we all know long, long ago. Thank you, Gail. Now let's just take a few moments to look a little closer at the flute and see just what makes it tick. The first part I'm taking out of the case is called the head joint. And as you notice, it has this little opening that we spoke about a moment ago. This is the top end of the flute. If I play on this portion of the flute, we'll get sort of like a whistle sound. In order to play other notes on the flute, we have to have a little more length of tubing. So we place the body of the flute with the head joint. And the lower part of the flute is called the foot joint, and that completes the full length of the flute. Now, if we blow across this hole, we form the tone to begin with. And as that air or tone travels down the flute, it comes out one of these openings here. As you notice, right by this key, we have an opening there. And all the way down the flute, there are a series of tone holes. If we close these holes, we force the air further down the flute, and as of course, then the flute becomes longer. As that happens, the tone changes. I'll demonstrate that. So really, there isn't too much mystery to the flute. We form the sound by blowing across the hole, and we change the notes by raising or lowering our fingers. Now let's move on to the next member of the woodwind family, the clarinet. Probably the most important part of the clarinet really is just this little tiny piece of cane we call a clarinet reed. And if you'll notice, it's quite narrow at the tip. It's been sort of scraped quite thin. Now the reason for that is that when it's placed on the mouthpiece, and we blow on it, it begins to wiggle and vibrate. And this is what causes the tone on the clarinet. Now we're going to have Peter demonstrate blowing the clarinet for us. And he's going to play a portion of America. <laughs> Very well done. Now let's take a moment and look at the clarinet. 
you'd be surprised that all of that long instrument could be put in such a small case. But there's a reason. There are so many parts. Now, we'll take this reed, and we must moisten it before we place it on what we call the mouthpiece. We hold the reed on the mouthpiece with a little clamp called a ligature. Now, if I play with this, just this portion of the instrument, it'll get a very high toot, tweet sound like. The next portion of the clarinet is called a barrel joint. It looks something like a small barrel, doesn't it? We add that to the mouthpiece and we get a little longer instrument, a little lower pitch. Something like a boat whistle, maybe. The upper part of the clarinet, we call the upper joint, is added. And now we have a little longer instrument. Notice the tone now has become quite a bit lower. We add the lower joint. And we have a longer instrument yet. What happened? It's still the same pitch. I thought if we got longer, Oh, that's right. Remember, we said if the tone come down the instrument, it must be determined by where it comes out. And these holes haven't changed. So when the air came down, it still comes out the same hole, even though I added on to the length of the instrument. So we got the same tone. Now we'll finish the clarinet by putting the bell joint on. Now I will demonstrate, if I close these holes, how the instrument changes pitch by forcing the air down through the complete length of the clarinet. So really, there's no great difference between the clarinet and the flute, as far as principles are ex concerned, except for the mouthpiece uh, having a reed which vibrates in the flute. We blow across the tone hole. And actually, we cover holes just like we did on a flute, just holding it a little differently. Now we'll continue on to the next wind instrument. And this is the saxophone. Bill, would you show us uh, the reed on the saxophone? You see, it's very similar to a clarinet, only though it's a little larger, of course. In fact, the whole instrument is a little larger. If we look at it closely, we can see that the instrument goes down and has to curl up a little bit at the end in order to get it all in one little package here. The tone holes are larger also, and therefore, because of that, we have to have pads that are quite large that cover the keys for the holes, and Bill will place his fingers on the keys, and that will cover the holes and change the pitch. Bill, will you please play a little bit on the saxophone, and I think he has a tune by the name of Swanee River. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Very well done. Now we've seen three of the instruments demonstrated from the woodwind family, the flute, the clarinet, and the saxophone. And I'm sure if one of these instruments appeals to you, you'll have a very enjoyable time learning to play on them. Now let's continue on our musical journey of exploration and find out what the brass family instruments are like. And here is Mr. Morris to explain these instruments to you. All the instruments of the brass family have a common type mouthpiece. It's called a cup mouthpiece because the inside of the mouthpiece looks like a cup, with one important difference, and that is there's a hole in the bottom of this cup. Now, it's through this hole that the brass player blows to produce the sound on the instrument. The mouthpiece is placed against the lips, and the player blows through the closed lips and a peculiar buzzing sound is formed. I have a cutaway rim of a mouthpiece here, which will allow us to see what the lips do inside the mouthpiece. Now, when this peculiar buzzing sound is blown through the mouthpiece and into a length of tubing, the characteristic sound of that brass instrument is transformed. Now I have here 
a bugle, which is just a mouthpiece placed on a long length of hollow tubing, which has been curled twice in order to take up less room. Now, as I place this mouthpiece on my lips and blow in the same manner, you'll hear how that sound has been transformed. If I want to change the pitch upwards, I must close my lips tighter, and this forces the air through the mouthpiece and through the tubing faster. Now, if I want to play any more than just those few notes, I have to, in some way, change the overall length of the tubing. Let's compare the bugle with the cornet. Now, the cornet and its sister instrument, the trumpet, are basically the same as the bugle, except you notice on the cornet that we have these three pistons, or valves. And when they are depressed, this diverts the air through different lengths of tubing. Now, Dale, will you show us how you can change pitch on the cornet by use of these valves? Fine. Now, you see, the, the bugle is limited to just simple bugle calls but these three or four notes, where the cornet can play several more notes and the melody of any song. Dale, will you play something else for us? Thank you, Dale. That melody is surely familiar to all of us. <clears throat> Let's move along to the next instrument of the brass family, and the instrument that uh, Harold is holding here is the French horn. And you notice right away that the tubing is wrapped differently, and there is much more of it. Now, the longer length of tubing is going to make the French horn sound lower than the cornet, and you will uh, notice this, I'm sure. Harold, you show us how uh, the pitch is lower on the... Uh, let's play a few notes and show us the lower notes. <laughs> I'm sure you noticed how the pitch was lower, and you might call richer also, richer tone. Uh, play something more for us, please, Earl. Thank you, Earl. The next instrument <coughs> in the brass family known as the trombone, and you notice right away that the instrument is longer, and you also notice that there are no valves or pistons on the trombone. Kevin, will you show us how you change pitch on the trombone? <laughs> ah, right away we notice that what we call a slide actually makes the instrument get longer right before our eyes. Now, the trombone is the instrument we see right up in the front of the marching band as it comes down the street. Kevin, will you play something more for us on the trombone? of the brass family, the cornet, the French horn, and the trombone. Now, these instruments all play a very important role in both the band and the orchestra. We'll move along now to our next family. Mr. Gabrin will explain the instruments of the string family for us. Boys and girls, you've seen how you can play the flute by blowing air across an opening, how you can play the clarinet and the saxophone by causing a reed to vibrate, and how you can play the trumpet, the trombone, and the French horn by having your lips vibrate. Now let's talk about that family of instruments which you can play by means of a vibrating string. 
And those of you who have attended a concert will know, of course, that the string instrument family is the heart of the orchestra. Now here's Richard to show us the king of the string instrument family, the violin. Thank you, Richard. The violin is a very easy instrument to understand. It can be played either by plucking the string, like this, or you can make the notes longer by using a bow. And for those of you who are curious, the bow is simply several strands of hair held tight by a specially carved piece of wood. The violin has four strings, which are attached to a fixed tailpiece at this end, extending over to this end to a movable tuning peg. Now, before Richard can play, he must first tune each string by use of these pegs. Notice that as I make the string tighter, the pitch becomes higher. And as I loosen the string, the pitch becomes lower. Once Richard has tuned all of the strings, he may play any song he likes simply by adding or removing fingers. Notice that as Richard adds each finger to a string, the pitch becomes higher, and as he removes each finger, the pitch becomes lower. Thank you, Richard. The viola might be called the big brother of the violin because really they're very, very similar except that the viola is somewhat fatter, somewhat wider, and somewhat longer. Consequently, it has a slightly richer quality. Anne, would you please show us the rich qualities of the viola? Thank you, Anne. And finally, we have an instrument very much like the violin once again, although you'll notice immediately that it is much larger. In fact, it can't possibly fit under your chin, so you must play it from a seated position. The cello has a, is a very versatile instrument. It has a range which uh, brings it into the viola register, and it can even sound like a violin at its highest point. At its lowest point, it sounds like a string bass. In fact, the low C string vibrates so slowly you can actually see it. Beverly, would you show us, please, the deeper, richer qualities of the cello? Thank you, Beverly. There you have the three instruments of the string instrument family, the violin, the viola, and the cello. Now back to Mr. Morris. You have now seen and heard each of these instruments individually. We will now ask our orchestra conductor, Mrs. Tarzia, to put these instruments together by sections, and then finally as a full orchestra. If you're still having difficulty trying to decide what instrument to play, it may help if you can hear the instruments playing together in their families. So let's review a little bit. You remember the woodwind family instruments? The first highest instrument were the flutes, and then the clarinets, and then saxophone. I'm going to ask these people to play together for you so you can hear that family sound.
Thank you, Woodwinds. That was a Woodwind family sound. Now, do you recall the Brass family? And in the Brass family, we had cornets, and we had French horns, and we had trombones. And if we put these instruments together in a little piece, this will give you the sound of the Brass family. Thank you, Brasses. Now, the next family is a, a very much larger family in the orchestra. And if you remember, Ga Mr. Gabriel a while ago told you that the string family was the king of the orchestra. And that is, he probably said that because we need so many strings in an orchestra. So when I ask the string family to stand, you'll see that there are more players. So let's see, violins, will you stand? And violas? and cellos. And now we'll hear what the string family sounds like. strings. We have one family left. It's our rhythm section family, and we call it the percussion family. And I'm going to ask the percussion to play for you and show you how we hold our rhythm section together. Thank you, percussion. Now, while you're finally trying to decide which instrument you really are going to play, let's put all of these families together and let you hear how a real orchestra sounds. And we'll play some of those same melodies that you just heard us play by families all together in the orchestra.
hope you have enjoyed listening to our orchestra and to our demonstration. We know that you have been looking forward to the time when you could begin the study of one of these instruments. Your own school orchestra director will explain to you how you may enroll in the beginning classes. May you have many pleasurable hours playing your very own instrument.